Evidently, there is some uproar over gun rights in this country and the attempted compromise over gun ownership rights by elements in the government, specifically elements in the Democratic Party, the extent of which I was not aware of until recently. I'm not personally a gun owner, but I'll tell you this, as a meat eater, and having witnessed some of the cruelty which takes place in these meatpacking facilities, I can't justify any sentiments against the men and women who go out in nature and hunt their game with their own weapons, be they firearms, crossbows, bow and arrow, or even fishing rods. Sure seems a lot more humane and natural than what takes place in these meatpacking facilities. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the justifications of these legislators in introducing some of these bills attempting to limit certain firearms is not chiefly to restrict the rights of hunters, though doubtless certain animal rights activists may be involved in certain lobbies and have this as a motivation. But Rather, I believe the chief motivation is to keep firearms of mass killing capacity out of the hands of the mentally ill. And of course, it's much easier to simply restrict people's rights across the board than for us to all work together toward the creation of a saner society. Now, this is going to sound like a strange angle from which to approach this problem, but bear with me here. And there's going to be some visual material in this video, which is not for the faint of heart. I'm going to talk about abortion. And I'm going to try and draw some parallels between this issue, which has become a great matter of contention, on the right, and by extension the Republican Party, and that of gun ownership which has become a great matter of contention on the left and by extension the Democratic Party. Here you can see a chart mapping the development of the human fetus from the early weeks of gestation through to the final weeks of gestation, ultimately leading to birth. The embryo in its earliest stage is indistinguishable from that of a chicken and over the course of nine months develops into something which is identifiably a human being. The precise moment which life begins is a matter of endless debate, and a source of endless controversy over the years that legislators have attempted to introduce bills which would restrict abortion rights past a certain trimester. Here is what I would not like to see. This is late-term abortion. This is a situation in which a fetus that has demonstrably, demonstrably developed into something which we can recognize as a human being has been aborted. And I do not believe it's a far cry to call this murder. Now, before we go crazy, let's take a look at the statistics. This from Wikipedia. In 2003, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported that 26% of reported legally induced abortions in the United States were known to have been attained and at less than 6 weeks gestation, 18% at 7 weeks, 15% at 8 weeks, 18% at 9 through 10 weeks, 10% at 11 through 12 weeks. 6% at 13 through 15 weeks, 4% at 16 through 20 weeks, and 1% at more than 21 weeks. The average complete natal period being 40 weeks, we can conclude, without defending it, that late-term abortion is an exceedingly rare phenomenon and there is ample evidence that it most often occurs in instances where the continuation of the pregnancy poses an existential health risk to the woman. 
Now, before I go any further with this analogy, it's important that we recognize something that could potentially be a bone of contention. That is, the Constitution, which speaks clearly and unmistakably about the right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, is completely silent on the subject of abortion. Imagine that. A document composed in 1787 doesn't have a lot to say about abortion. This brings us to the 19th Amendment. What happened was James Madison, having formulated the first eight amendments in the Bill of Rights, realized it would be impossible to enumerate in any single document all the rights which these amendments intended to safeguard and so the Ninth Amendment serves the purpose of saying, hey, just because we didn't specifically list such, such and such right doesn't mean any state should be permitted to take it away. And it reads thus. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And it was these unspecified rights to which the justices of the Supreme Court turned in the framing their arguments in defense of the majority decision Roe v. Wade in 1973. Reference was also made to the rights of privacy, personal liberty, and restrictions upon state action upheld by the 14th Amendment. Again, from Wikipedia. The court reasoned that outlawing abortions would infringe a pregnant woman's right to privacy for several, for several reasons. Having unwanted children may force upon the woman a distressful life and future. It may bring imminent psychological harm Caring for the child may tax the mother's physical and mental health. And because there may, may be distress for all concerned associated with the unwanted child. However, after recognizing this right, the court then rejected the notion that a pregnant woman's right to abort her pregnancy was absolute. Holding that instead, it must be balanced against certain other government interests. The court found two government interests that were sufficiently compelling to permit states to impose some limitations on the right to choose to have an abortion. First, protecting the mother's health. Second, protecting the life of the fetus. The state of Texas had argued that total bans on abortion were justifiable because life begins at the moment of conception and therefore its government governmental interest in protecting prenatal life applied to all pregnancies regardless of their stage but the court found that there was no indication that the constitution's uses of the word person were meant to include fetuses and so it rejected texas's argument that a fetus should be considered a person with legal and constitutional right to life. It is noted there was still great disagreement over when an unborn fetus becomes a living being. Quote, We need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins, when those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus. The judiciary, in this point in the development of man's knowledge, is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. Unquote. The court settled on the three trimesters of pregnancy as the framework to resolve the problem. During the first trimester, when it was believed that the procedure was safer than childbirth, the court ruled the government could place no restriction on a woman's ability to choose to abort a pregnancy other than minimal medical safeguards, such as requiring a licensed physician to perform the procedure. From the second trimester on, the court ruled that evidence of increasing risks to the mother's health 
gave the state a compelling interest and that it could enact medical regulations on the procedure so long as they were reasonable and narrowly tailored to protecting the mother's health. <clears throat> Since the beginning of the third trimester was normally considered to be the point at which a fetus became viable under the level of medical science available in the early 1970s, the court ruled that during the third trimester, the state had a compelling interest in protecting prenatal life and could legally prohibit all abortions except where necessary to protect the mother's life or health. Now, I give you a chart mapping opinion on Roe v. Wade from the time the court's decision up to 2015. The blue lines indicate percentages in favor and the red lines percentages in opposition and we can clearly see that public opinion has remained closely aligned to the majority political consensus at any given time. Folks, I would submit to you that the legality of abortion is probably not going anywhere anytime soon. This is the point at which compromise becomes necessary in order to maintain rule of law. If one individual supposes that life begins at the moment of conception and that any termination of pregnancy past this point constitutes murder, they are more than entitled to that opinion. Good luck turning this opinion into law without inciting mass havoc and ultimately violence. In 47 years, I ask, how much sane progress has been made in instituting this opinion? If another individual supposes that a woman's right to choose independent of matters of her own health and safety extends through the full natal period up to including the 40th week of gestation, they are more than entitled to that opinion. Good luck turning this opinion into law without inciting mass havoc and ultimately violence. In 47 years, I ask how much sane progress has been made in instituting this opinion. Folks, this is the point where we turn to our educators, the people who know about this stuff, and are studying it as we speak. In order to draw a picture of the moral development of the fetus and so to pinpoint a consensus moment in the gestation period at which the fetus can be said to be alive, sensitive to pain, identifiably a human being, and at which the termination of a pregnancy can be said to constitute murder. Compromise, folks, is the only way forward on this matter. Now, I don't have no crystal ball. <laughs> I just wanted to show <laughs> I like crystal ball. I don't have no crystal. I wish I did. But I can tell you that in the event compromise is not sought by either of the extremist elements in the abortion debate and in the event that we come to blows over this, I think I know who's going to win. The extreme right wing in the United States now, you might not consider your views extreme by the standards of your own upbringing, community values, religious views, etc. I speak merely within the context of the debate. The extreme right wing is majority white, majority Christian, majority suburban or rural, the Democratic, demo, excuse me, demographic data simply does not indicate that this element is sustainable in numbers to withstand a confrontation with the leftist progressive element in this country. I am not stating my own opinions here. I am stating what I believe is numerical reality. And for elaboration, I'll refer you to the last video I uploaded on the Civil War where I outlined, a I outlined a vision of an Old Testament type of God who speaks in numbers. 
and whose judgments are always correct, little as we comprehend them in our own tiny neck of the woods. Fellas, if you pick a fight over this one, it's a fight you can't win. Which brings me at last to the subject at hand. The Second Amendment to the Constitution reads thus, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, what does it mean? Sounds straightforward enough, but we all know how people have a way of complicating everything. And so it has transpired that multiple interpretations of this amendment have been advanced over the years. Once again, from Wikipedia. In the latter half of the 20th century, there was considerable debate over whether the Second Amendment protected an individual right or a collective right. The debate centered on whether the prefatory clause, a well-regulated necessary to the security of a free state, declared the amendment's only purpose or merely announced a purpose to introduce the operative clause, the right of the people to bear, keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Scholars advanced three competing theoretical mod models for how the prefatory clause should be interpreted. The first, known as the state's rights or collective right model, held that the Second Amendment does not apply to individuals, rather it recognizes the right of each state to arm its militia. Under this approach, citizens have no right to keep or bear arms, but the states have a collective right to have the National Guard. Advocates of collective rights models argued that the Second Amendment was written to prevent the federal government from dis disarming the state militias, rather than to secure an individual right to possess firearms. Prior to 2001, every circuit court decision that interpreted the Second Amendment endorsed the collective right model. However, beginning with the Fifth Circuit's opinion, United States v. Emerson in 2001, some circuit court judges recognized that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms. The second, known as the Sophisticated Collective Right Model, held that the Second Amendment recognizes some limited individual right. However, this individual right could be exercised only by actively participating members of a functioning organized state militia. Some scholars have argued that the Sophisticated Collective Rights Model is in fact the functional equivalent of the collective rights model. <clears throat> Other commentators have observed that prior to Emerson, five circuit courts specifically endorsed the sophisticated collective right model. The third, known as the standard model, held that the Second Amendment recognized the personal right of individuals to keep and bear arms. Supporters of this model argue that Although the first clause may describe a general purpose for the amendment, the second clause is controlling and therefore the amendment confers an individual right of the people to keep and bear arms. Additionally, scholars who favored this model argued the absence of founding era militias mentioned in the amendment's preamble does not render it a dead letter because the preamble is a philosophical declaration safeguarding militias and is but one of multiple civic purposes for which the amendment was enacted. Now, I was surprised to find out that the collective or states' rights interpretation was actually the preferred one of the courts up until quite recently in American history. I believe we've all kind of internalized what's referred to as the standard model of the Second Amendment. 
conferring the right to bear arms on the individual citizen. Now, here's why I think it's correct. Again, the amendment reads that the rights of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. If the substance of the amendment depended on the prefatory clause, then one would expect the amendment to read the rights of the militia to bear arms shall not be infringed. And so, unless the framers of our Constitution were being very careless in their language, which I don't believe to be the case, then we can fairly ascertain that this amendment is intended to safeguard individual rights. Now, having defined the subject at hand, and with due regards to the analogy which has been drawn with the issue of abortion rights, here is what I would like not to see, and viewer discretion for what follows is strongly, strongly advised. of the deadliest mass shooting incident in recorded U.S. history, the incident in Las Vegas in October 2017, and of the havoc which ensued. Well, I think we can all agree that nobody wants to see this. This being the capacity of a mentally ill individual with access to firearms to inflict mass killing on innocent people. Now, before we go crazy, Let's take a look at the statistics. This from Giffords.com. 36,000 Americans are killed by guns each year, an average of 100 per day. 100,000 Americans are shot and injured each year. In 2017, gun deaths reached their highest level in at least 40 years with, with 39,773 deaths in that year alone. Finally, gun deaths increased 16% from 2014 to 2017. Now, I'm aware of the sentiments of right-leaning individuals, of biases in the media, the left-leaning biases of certain search engines like Google and Bing, and I believe much of it is justified, some exaggerated. Now, one bias which is embedded in the presentation of these statistics is the lack of factoring in suicides as a growing problem and a major contributor to their growing severity. So, now let's take a look at some statistics on suicide. <laughs> Wikipedia says... What does Wikipedia say? Wikipedia says the annual age-adjusted suicide rate is 13.42 per 100,000 individuals. Men die by suicide 3.53 times more than women. On average, there are 123 suicides per day. White males accounted for 7 of 10 suicides in 2016. A firearm is used in almost 50% of all suicides. Uh, the rate of suicide is highest in middle age, white men in particular. And finally, let us not forget the insurmountable toll gun violence takes every year in our poorest neighborhoods.
um, Wikipedia. <coughs> Prevalence of homicide and violent crime is higher in statistical metropolitan areas of the U.S. than it is in non-metropolitan counties. The vast majority of the U.S. population lives in statistical metropolitan areas. In metropolitan areas, the, fund the hom homicide rate in 2013 was 4.7 per 100,000 compared with 3.4 in non-metropolitan counties. More narrowly, the rates of murder and non-negligent manslaughter are identical in metropolitan counties and non-metropolitan counties. In U.S. cities with populations greater than 250,000, the mean homicide rate was 12.1 per 100,000. According to FBI statistics, the highest per capita rates of gun-related homicides in 2005 were in Washington, D.C., 35.4 out of 100,000. Puerto Rico, 19.6 out of 100,000. Louisiana, 9.9 .9 out of 100,000. And Maryland, 9.9 .9 out of 100,000. In 2017, according to the Associated Press, Baltimore broke a record for homicides. In 2005, the 17 to 24 age group was significantly overrepresented in violent crime statistics, particularly homicides involving firearms. In 2005, 17 to 19 year olds were 4.3 of the overall population of the U.S., but 11.2 of those killed in firearm harm homicides. This age group also accounted for 10.6 of all homicide offenses. The 20 to 24 year old age group accounted for 7.1 of the population, but 22.5 of those killed in firearm homicides. The 20 to 24 age group also accounted for 17.7 of all homicide offenses. Those under 17 are not overrepresented in homicide statistics. In 2005, 13 to 16 year olds accounted for 6% of the overpopulate, overall population of the U.S., but only 3.6 of firearm homicide victims and 2.7 of overall homicide offenses. <clears throat> People with a criminal record are more likely to die as homicide victims. Between 1990 and 1994, 75% of all homicide victims aged 21 and younger in the city of Boston had a prior, prior criminal record. In Philadelphia, the percentage of, of those killed in gun homicides that had prior criminal records increased 73% from 1985 to 93% in 1996. In Richmond, Virginia, the risk of gunshot injury is 22 times higher for those males involved with crime. It is significantly more likely that a death will result when either the victim or the attacker has a firearm. The mortality rate for gunshot wounds to the heart is 84% compared to 30% for people who suffer stab wounds to the heart. In the United States, states with higher gun ownership rates have higher rates of gun homicides and homicides overall, but not higher rates of non-gun homicides. Higher gun availability is positively associated with homicide rates. However, there is evidence that gun ownership has more of an effect on rates of gun suicide than it does on gun homicide. Some studies suggest that the concept of guns can prime aggressive thoughts and aggressive reactions. An experiment by Berkowitz and LePage in 1967 examined this weapons effect. Ultimately, when study participants were provoked, their reaction was substantially more aggressive when a gun, in contrast with a more benign object like a tennis racket, was visibly present in the room. Other similar experiments, like those conducted by Carson, Marcus Newhall, and Miller, yield similar results. 
Such results imply that the presence of a gun in an altercation could elicit an aggressive reaction which may result in homicide. However, the demonstration of such reactions in experimental settings does not entail that this would be true in reality. Well, people are going around with guns and needless murders are ensuing. And yes, there is reliable evidence that the mere presence of guns in close quarters, I'm not talking about Sweet Home on the Range, I'm talking about inner cities, provokes an atmosphere of fear of antagonism among poor children from poor families. Can we at least not afford these kids their share of public education and well-funded schools and offer them free access to higher education so we can produce a healthier, less violence-ridden generation of inner-city youth? So, with all that said, time we familiarize ourselves with some of the differences in firearms and maybe we might find some parallel in our earlier comparison of the natal process as the guiding function of our need for compromise on abortion rights then we might uncover some means for compromise on gun rights this again from wikipedia which i do find a consistently factual source of information not always necessarily god's word i'll remind you i'm wholly uneducated on firearms and i will be guilty of many comical mispronunciations of model numbers and military speak in a state of complete ignorance on these matters but i am eager to learn but this may be comical. Firearms include a variety of ranged weapons, and there is no agreed upon definition. In the United States, under 26 USCA Section 861A, the term firearm means one, a shotgun having a barrel or barrels less than 18 inches in length, two, a weapon made from a shotgun if such weapon as modified has an overall length of less than 26 inches or a barrel or barrels of less than 18 inches in length, three, a rifle having a barrel or barrels of less than 16 inches in length, and four, a weapon made from a rifle if such weapon as modified has an overall length of less than 26 inches or a barrel or barrel of less than 16 inches in length 5. Any weapon as defined in subsection 6. A machine gun. 7. Any silencer as detailed in section 921 of title 18 United States Code. The term firearm shall not include an antique firearm or any device other than a machine gun or destructive device which, although designed as a weapon, the secretary finds reason of the date of its manufacture, value, design, and other characteristics is primarily a collector's item and not likely to be used as a weapon. <clears throat> the term small arms generally refers to any kinetic projectile firearm, small and light enough to be carried carried and operated by a single infantryman. Such firearms include handguns such as revolvers, pistols, and derringers, and long guns such as rifles, of which there are many subtypes, such as anti-material rifles, sniper rifles, designated marksman rifles, battle rifles, assault rifles, and carbines. Sh shotguns, submachine guns, personal defense weapons, squad automatic weapons, and light machine guns. The world's top small arms manufacturing companies are Browning, Remington, Colt, Ruger, Smith & Wesson, Savage, Mossberg, Heckler & Koch, Sig Sauer, Walter, Germany, Czech Republic, Glock, 
Steyr, Manlicker, Austria, FN, Herstal, Belgium, Beretta, Italy, Norinko, China, Tula Arms, and Kalishnikov, Russia. While former top producers included Mauser, Springfield Armory, and Rock Island Armory under Arms Corps, Philippines. As of 2018, the Small Arms Survey reported that there were over 1 billion small arms distributed globally, of which 857 million, about 85%, were in civilian hands. The civilians alone account for 393 million, about 46% of the worldwide total of civilian held firearms. This amounts to 120.5 firearms for every 100 residents. The world's armed forces control about 133 million, about 13% of the global total of small arms, of which over 43% belong to two countries, the Russian Federation, 30.3 million, and China, 27.5 million. Law enforcement agencies control about 23 million, about 2% of the global total of small arms. And guys. The smallest of firearms is the handgun. There are two types of handguns, revolvers and semi-automatic pistols. Revolvers have a number of firing chambers or charge holes in a revolving cylinder. Each chamber in the cylinder is loaded with a single cartridge or charge. Semi-automatic pistols have a single fixed firing chamber machined into the rear of the barrel and a magazine so they can be used to fire more than one round. Each press of the trigger fires a cartridge, using the energy of the cartridge to activate a mechanism so that the next cartridge may be fired immediately. This is opposed to double action revolvers, which accomplish the same end using a mechanical action linked to the trigger pull. With the invention of the revolver in 1818, handguns capable of holding multiple rounds became popular. Certain designs of auto-loading pistols <coughs> auto-loading pistol appeared beginning in the 1870s and had largely supplanted revolvers in military applications by the end of World War I. By the end of the 20th century, most handguns carried regularly by military police and civilians were semi-automatic, although revolvers were still widely used. Generally speaking, military and police forces use semi-automatic weapons due to their high magazine cap capacities and ability to rapidly reload by simply removing the empty magazine and inserting a loaded one. Revolvers are very common among handgun hunters because revolver cartridges are usually more powerful than similar caliber semi-automatic pistol cartridges which are designed for self-defense and the strength, simplicity, and durability of the revolver design is well suited to outdoor use. Revolvers, especially in 22 LR and 38 Special 357 Magnum, are also common concealed weapons in jurisdictions allowing this practice because their simple mechanics make them smaller than many auto loaders while remaining reliable. Both designs are common among civilian gun owners depending on the gun owner's intentions, self-defense, hunting, target shooting, competitions, collecting, etc. Long guns. A long gun is generally any firearm that is larger than a handgun and is designed to be held and fired with both hands, either from the hip or the shoulder. Long guns typically have a barrel between 10 and 30 inches. There are restrictions on minimum barrel length in many jurisdictions. Maximum barrel length is usually a matter of practicality. That, along with the receiver and trigger group, is mounted into a wood, plastic, metal, or composite stock composed of one or more pieces that form a foregrip, rear grip, and optionally, but typically, a shoulder mount called the butt. Early long arms from the Renaissance up to the mid 19th century were generally smooth bare fire, smooth bore firearms that fired one or more ball shot called muskets or argipos, depending on caliber and a firing mechanism. 
rifles and shotguns. Most modern long guns are either rifles or shotguns. Both are the successors of the musket, diverting from their parent weapon in distinct ways. A rifle is so named for the spiral fluting rifling machined into the inner surface of its barrel, which imparts a self-stabilizing spin to the single bullets it fires. Shotguns are predominantly smooth bore firearms designed to fire a number of shot pellet sizes commonly ranging between 2mm number 9 birdshot and an 8.4mm double lot buckshot. Shotguns are also capable of firing single slugs and specialty often less lethal rounds such as bean bags, tear gas, and breaching rounds. Rifles have a very small impact area but a long and high accuracy. Shotguns have a large impact area with considerably less range and accuracy. However, the larger impact area can compensate for reduced accuracy since sh shot spreads during flight and consequently in hunting shotguns are generally used for flying game. Rifles and shotguns are commonly used for hunting and often to defend a home or place of business. Usually large game are hunted with rifles, although shotguns can be used particularly with slugs, while birds are hunted with shotguns. Shotguns are sometimes preferred for defending a home or business due to their wide impact area, multiple wound tracks when using buckshot shorter range and reduced penetration of walls when using lighter shot which significantly reduces the likelihood of unintended harm although the handgun is also common there are a variety of types of rifles and shotguns based on the method they are reloaded bolt action and lever action rifles are manually operated Manipulation of the bolt or the lever causes the spent cartridges to be removed, the firing mechanism recocked, and a special cartridge inserted. These two types of action are almost exclusively used by rifles. Slide action, commonly called pump action rifles, and shotguns are manually cycled by shuttling the foregrip of the firearm back and forth. This type of action is typically used by shotguns, but several major manufacturers make rifles that use for this action. Both rifles and shotguns also come in break action varieties that do not have any kind of reloading mechanism at all but must be hand loaded after each shot. Both rifles and shotguns come in single and double barreled varieties. However, due to the expense and difficulty of manufacturing, double barreled rifles are very rare. Double-barreled rifles are typically intended for African big game hunts where the animals are dangerous, ranges are short, and speed is of the essence. Very large and powerful cal calibers are normal for these firearms. Rifles have been in nationally featured marksmanship events in Europe and the United States since at least the 18th century when rifles were first becoming widely available. One of the earliest purely American rifle shooting competitions took place in 1775 when Daniel Morgan was recruiting sharp shooters in Virginia for the impending American Revolutionary War. In some countries, rifle marksmanship is still a matter of national pride. Some specialized rifles in the larger calibers are claimed to have an accurate range of up to about one mile although most have considerably less. In the latter half of the 20th century, competitive shotgun sports became perhaps even more popular than riflery, largely due to the motion and immediate feedback in activities such as skeet trap and sporting clays. In military use, bolt action rifles with high power scopes are common as sniper rifles. However, by the Korean War, the traditional bolt action and semi automatic rifles used by infantrymen have been supplemented by select fire designs known as automatic rifles. Carbine. 
A carbide is a firearm similar in form and intended usage, but generally shorter and smaller than the typical full-size hunting or battle rifle of a similar time period, and sometimes using a smaller or less powerful cartridge. Carbides were and are typically used by members of the military in roles that are expected to engage in combat. But where a full-size rifle would be an impediment to the primary duties of that soldier, vehicle drivers, field commanders, and support staff, airborne troops, engineers, etc., carbines are also common in law enforcement and among civilian owners where similar size, space, and or power concerns may exist. Carbines, like rifles, can be single-shot, uh, repeating action, semi-automatic, select fire, fully automatic, generally depending on the time period and intended market. Common historical examples include the Winchester model of 1892, the Enfield Jungle Carbine, SKS M1 Carbine, no relation to the larger M1 Grand, the M4 Carbine, a more compact variant of the current M16 rifle. Modern U.S. civilian carbines include Compact customizations of the AR-15, Ruger Mini-14, Beretta CX-4, Storm, kel Sub-2000, Bold Action Rifles, generally falling under the specifications of a Scout Rifle, and aftermarket conversion kits for popular pistols, including the M1911 and Glock models. Machine Gun. A machine gun is a fully automatic firearm, most often separated from other classes of atom automatic weaponry by the use of bell-fed ammunition, though some designs employ empty drum pan or hopper magazines, and generally in a rifle-inspired caliber ranging between 5.56 by 45 millimeters NATO to 23 Remington for a light machine gun to as large as a 50 BMG or even for crude or aircraft weapons. Although not widely fielded until World War I, early machine guns were being used by militaries in the second half of the 19th century. Notables in the U.S. arsenal during the 20th century included the M2 Browning 50 caliber heavy machine gun, the M1919 Browning 30 caliber medium machine gun and the M60 762 by 51 millimeter NATO general purpose machine gun which came into use around the Vietnam War. Machine guns of this type were originally defensive firearms crewed by at least two men mainly because of the difficulties involved in moving and placing them, their ammunition and their tripod. In contrast, modern light machine guns such as the FN Minimi are often wielded by a single infantryman. They provide a large ammunition capacity and a high rate of fire and are typically used to give suppressing fire during infantry movement. Accuracy on machine guns varies based on a wide number of factors from design to manufacturing tolerances, most of which have been improved over time. Machine guns are often mounted on vehicles or helicopters and have been used since World War I as offensive firearms in fighter aircraft and tanks, e.g. for air combat or suppressing fire for ground troop support. The definition of machine gun is different in U.S. law. The National Firearms Act and Firearm Owners Protection Act defined a machine gun as the United States Code Title 26 Subtitle E Chapter 53 Subchapter B Part 1 Section 5845 as any firearm which shoots automatically more than one shot without manually re re reloading by a single function of the trigger. A machine gun is therefore largely synonymous with automatic weapon in the U.S. civilian parlance, covering all automatic weapons. Sniper rifles. The definition of 
definition of a sniper rifle is disputed among military police and civilian observers alike. However, most generally define a sniper rifle as a high-powered semi-automatic bolt-action precision rifle with an accurate range further than that of a standard rifle. These are often purpose-built for their applications. For example, a police sniper rifle, sniper rifle may differ in specs from a military rifle. Police snipers generally do not engage targets at extreme range, but rather a target at medium range. They may also have multiple targets within the shorter range, and thus a semi-automatic model is preferred to a bolt action. They may also be more compact than mil-spec rifles, as police marksmen may need more portability. On the other hand, a military rifle is more likely to use a high-powered cartridge to defeat body armor or immediate light cover. They are more commonly, but not a lot more bolt action, as they are simpler to build and maintain. Also, due to fewer moving and overall parts, they are much more reliable under adverse conditions. They may also have a more powerful scope to acquire targets further away. Overall, units never became prominent until World War I, when the Germans displayed their usefulness on the battlefield. Since then, they have become irrevocably, irrevocably embedded in warfare. Examples of sniper rifles include the Accuracy International AWM, Sako TRG-42, and the Chaytac M200. Examples of specialized sniper cartridges include the 338 Lapua Magnum, the 300 Winchester Magnum, and the 408 Chaytac Rounds submachine guns. A submachine gun is a magazine fed firearm, usually smaller than other automatic firearms that fires pistol caliber ammunition. For this reason, certain machine guns can also be referred to as machine pistols, especially when referring to handgun size designs, such as the Scorpion and Glock 18. Well-known examples are the Israeli Uzi and Heckler and Koch's MP5, which use the nine by nine millimeter pallet Parabellum carriage and the American Thompson submachine gun, which fires 45 ACP. Because of their small size and limited projectile penetration compared to higher power rifle rounds, submachine guns are commonly favored by military, paramilitary, and police forces for close quarters engagements, such as inside buildings and urban areas or in trench complexes. Submachine guns were originally about the size of carbines, but they fire pistol ammunition. They have limited long range use, but in close combat can be used in fully automatic in a controllable manner due to the light recoil of the pistol ammunition. They are also extremely inexpensive and simple to build in time of war, enabling a nation to quickly arm its military. In the latter half of the 20th century, submarine guns were being miniaturized to the point of being only slightly larger than some large handguns. The most widely used submachine gun at the end of the 20th century was the Heckler & Koch MP5. The MP5 is actually designated as a machine pistol by Heckler & Koch. MP5 stands for mesh machine pistol. Uh, though some reserve this designation for even smaller submachine guns, such as the MAC-10 and Glock-18, which are about the size and shape of pistols. Automatic rifles. Automatic rifles. An automatic rifle is a magazine-led firearm wielded by a single infantryman that is chambered for rifle cartridges and capable of automatic fire. The M1918 Browning automatic rifle was the first U.S. infantry weapon of this type and was generally used for suppressive or support fire in the role now usually filled by the light machine gun. Other early automatic rifles included the Fedorov Aftomat and the Huat automatic rifle. 
later German forces fielded the Sturmgauer 44 during World War II, a light automatic firing reduced power intermediate cartridge. This design was to become the basis for the assault rifle subclass of automatic weapons, as contrasted with battle rifles, which fired generally fire a traditional full power rifle cartridge. Assault rifles. In World War II, Germany introduced the STG-44 and brought to the forefront, forefront of firearm technology what eventually became the class of firearm most widely adopted by the military, the assault rifle. The assault rifle is, us is usually slightly smaller than a battle rifle, such as the American M14, but the chief differences defining an assault rifle are select fire capability and the use of a rifle round of lesser power known as the intermediate cartridge. Soviet engineer Mikhail Kalishnikov quickly adopted the German concept using a powerful 7.62 by 39 millimeter cartridge derived from the standard 7.62 by 54 millimeter Russian paddle rifle round to produce the AK-47, which has become the world's most widely used assault rifle. Soon after World War II, the automatic Kalishnikov AK-47 assault rifle began to be fielded by the Soviet Union and its allies in the Eastern Bloc, as well as by nations such as China, Korea, and North Vietnam. In the United States, the assault rifle design was later in coming. The displacement for the M1 Garand of World War II was another John Garand design chambered for the new 762 by 54 millimeter NATO cartridge. The select fire M14 which was used by the US military until the 1960s. The significant recoil of the M14 when fired in fully automatic mode was seen as a problem as it reduced accuracy and in the 1960s it was replaced by Eugene Stoner's AR-15 which also marked a switch from the powerful 30 caliber cartridges used by the US military up until early in the Vietnam War to the much less powerful but far lighter and light recoiling 223 caliber intermediate cartridge. The military later designated the AR-15 as the M-16 the civilian version of the M16 continues to be known as the AR15 and looks exactly like the military version, except to conform to BATFE regulations in the US, it lacks the mechanism that permits fully automatic fire. Variants of both the M16 and AK47 are still in wide international use today, though automatic rifle designs have since been introduced. A small version of the M16 A2 and M4 carbine is widely used by US and NATO tank and vehicle crews, airborne support staff, and in other scenarios where space is limited. The IMI Galil, an Israeli design weapon based on the action of the AK-47 is in use by Israel, Italy, Burma, the Philippines, Peru, Colombia, Swiss Arms of Switzerland produces the SIG SG-550 assault rifle used by France, Chile, and Spain among others and Steyr Manlicker produces the AUG, a bullpup rifle in use in Austria, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Saudi Arabia, among other nations. Most designs, modern designs, call for compact we weapons retaining firepower. The bullpup design, by mounting the magazine behind the trigger, unifies the accuracy of the firepower of the traditional assault rifle with the compact size of the submachine gun. 
though submachine guns are still used. Examples of are the French FAMAS and the British SA-80. And now we got personal defense weapons and battle rifles. And that's about enough gun facts for me. So there you have it. There's an attempt to understand what these things are. Can cannot we on the right return to our analogy of the NATO period of the human and recognize that these weapons were some continuum of a similar gestation period whereby they enter conception as mere inaccurate close quarter combat weapons which often misfired as indistinguishable from the tools of our ancestors as we in our embryonic state are from chickens we evolved these things into mass killing machines machines of warfare surely there is some consensus we can reach with the existence of our educators to delineate a stage in this similar net natal development although be it a development unforeseen by man and unforeseen by our founding fathers it is still very much of nature insofar as man is part of nature then surely we can begin to have a conversation about the developments of these guns from a period of conception where they were barely a cut above swords axes and knives to the present advanced forms which seems to have been designed as mass killing machines. Surely in the interest of righteousness for the safety of our children, we, much, we must work at least just so long as people of troubled mind walk amongst us to limit the accessibility of certain classes of firearms. For we cannot know all who are crazy, and certainly many among them are taking full advantage of their Second Amendment rights. May we not work to limit the capacity of these individuals to end lives by limiting the amount of rounds they can fire in a given amount of time and the damage of the bullets or impact while simultaneously working to invest in and educate our inner city youths so disproportionately the victims of needless gun violence. Folks, I submit to you that gun rights is not going anywhere anytime soon. This is the point at which compromise becomes necessary to maintain rule of law. If one individual supposes that the right to bear arms, classified rightly or not as assault weapons, such as M16s and AK-47s, is safeguarded by the Second Amendment, they are more than entitled to that opinion. Good luck turning this opinion into law without inciting mass havoc and ultimately violence. If another individual supposes that the Second Amendment safeguards no right to bear arms to the individual and merely to the hands of the state militias which have long since been superseded by the National Armed Forces, they are more than entitled to this opinion. Good luck turning this opinion into law without inciting mass havoc and ultimately violence. In 233 years, I ask, how much sane progress has been made in instituting either of these opinions? Folks, I think you need, I think you know the drill. This is the part where we turn to our educators, the ones who are studying this subject as we speak from a variety of angles, sociological, political, humanitarian, psychological. Compromise, folks, is the only way forward on this matter. Now, I don't have no crystal ball, wish I did, I wish I did. But I can say that in the event that compromise is not sought by either of the extremist elements in the gun rights debate, and we come to blows over this, I think I know who's going to win. 
the white nativist element simply does not have the sustainable means and numbers to wage a contest against the growing progressive element in the United States. Fellas, I am not stating my opinions. I believe I am stating demographic numerical facts. And fellas, since I'm buddies with a lot of you, I wouldn't want to get you see see you get caught up in a fight that you can't win. And I don't know about you, my name's going to be in the history books. It's going to be first as a peacemaker, secondly, without option, maybe as a victor. I wouldn't want to be on the losing side, not when I've seen it coming all along. And as we all know, history is written by the victors. And insofar as we put our feet in a God whose ultimate intentions are mysterious to us, we may suppose it proper and righteous that this is so. So at last, before it comes to that, in the promotion of peace, I give you one proposition each as a nation divided in two. The right. Embrace the spirit of compromise. The left. Embrace the possibility of a higher power which guides us upwards in our principles. And let us all, left and right, educate ourselves with the reliable user edited free information that can be found on websites of like Wikipedia and Quora. And let's expose ourselves to alternative viewpoints and engage what the other person has to say. And I promise things will get better.